Yeah. So um, thanks for coming on, Jane. No worries. It's uh, been a while since we last talked last time you did that. Uh, several yeah. For the league. But uh, yeah, crazy period of time since then. Been? Yeah. Can you can you uh, fill me in on on? So I think the last time we talked, you were with Dallas Fuel, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So and- I'm still, uh, as far as I can announce, I'm still with Dallas. Okay. Um, yeah. So I am going to be moving to Dallas in November. Okay. Uh, and then right now I'm in Toronto for the Team Canada boot camp. Okay. Uh, so Overactive Media and Bell Canada uh, sponsored us to come up to Toronto to just the one week before the World Cup to get ready for the tournaments down in Anaheim, California there. Team USA has had uh, NVIDIA as a sponsor the last two or three years, and they've mm. had a pretty nice boot camp set up. So uh, actually being in person and having the full team there instead of trying to practice remote, which is you know usually standard fare, especially for not just um, basically everyone except the league teams practices remotely. But it is really quite a big jump up once you are able to get everybody in the same location, you know, live together, eat together, practice together, that whole thing. So, yeah, we're on day three. The first scrim block starts in about an hour and a half. Mm. Um, but yeah, so this is day three. And then we're going to have media day tomorrow. One final kind of prep day to simulate the actual tournament itself. And then we're down to Anaheim to compete, compete at the World Cup. That's awesome, man. And how have you been? Oh, I've been doing... I've been really, really busy. There's, uh, you know, normally people know me for my Twitch and my YouTube stuff, but uh, pretty much the only social media that I've been active on recently has been Twitter. Uh, not because I, like, I'm feeling a lot better. I had that, uh, I, I stepped back from social media because I was having a pretty uh, a high period of stress, I guess you could call it. Stepped back yeah. from social media earlier in the year. Um, but the reason that I haven't fully returned to it yet is yes, there's these things with like World Cup where I'm up at the uh, boot camp, but uh, uh, I'm also working on some still secret projects that I want to uh, finish off, and hopefully I can announce the, some of those in November. But uh, yeah, looking to return to the actual Twitch and YouTube stuff probably late November, uh, early December. It's one of those things where there's there's a lot of things that can be done in the Overwatch ecosystem, I suppose mm-hmm. is the best way to put it. You know, if you're looking at like the National Hockey League or something like that, they're uh, still figuring things out after 100 years. You know, the Overwatch League has sprung into existence. We just finished the second year. And so while it, it's quite large and impressive with a lot of franchise teams, there's still a lot of things that need to be done down at kind of like the, the foundation. Um, like and because what? of the Overwatch League, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of just checks and balances that aren't in place yet. Mm. Um, you know, there's no union for developers of games. There's no players association for players, whether it's whether you're talking Overwatch, Blizzard, or any Activision game, uh, things like that. You know, the major difference between you have like the NBA, where you know anybody like if you like, let's take baseball for example. If you wanted to go play a, a game of baseball, all you really need is a bat, a ball, and you know, white spray paint in a grass field. Mm-hmm. But Overwatch League and any esport, really, any and every esport is a little bit different, where in order to have the permission to play the game, you need to have a license to the game, access to the servers, which means you need um, terms of service and user license agreements. And then those legal protections also extend to the point where uh, companies have control over running tournaments and events. You can't, like, even if you and all of your friends own overwatch at the game technically you can't run a tournament without blizzard's permission so there's Hmm. some differences in legal structures where although we're modeling the overwatch league and we being not me personally but although the overwatch league is being modeled after these large franchise sports leagues there are some very key structural differences which i don't feel you know they haven't been figured out yet we're still you know we're going for broke we're figuring out as we go along um but yeah, there's uh, there's more to be done that could make the league uh, a lot better. Yeah. So I I mean I think you know the last time we talked I I got a, a a substantial appreciation for just how different things are in terms of players as well. Like I didn't realize sort of the cognitive impact of becoming a professional Overwatch player at the age of eighteen, <laughs> and kind of like what that does to you. Um, And I I remember kind of at that workshop, you know, a lot of people were just talking a lot about sort of managing teams and how that's difficult. Um, Is there is that 
So generally speaking, I guess people on this stream, like we tend to try to talk a lot about people's personal experiences because I think that's what people mm -hmm. find helpful. Um, yep. And you were saying that things have been stressful. Can you tell us yeah. a little bit about what's been stressful? <laughs> uh, that's a very broad, um, I mean, everything has its own level of stress you're doing. Yeah. You know, for, you know, it's, I've got the Team Canada thing going on. We're obviously competing on the world stage literally next week. Um, I work for Dallas as a coach. I'm doing other duties that I haven't announced yet. Um, and then there's, there's stress behind that. Obviously, it's an organization that's trying to uh, make basically the future of sports in general. And then on top of that, I have my, uh, my side project. I wouldn't even really call it side projects. I start up organization that's trying to support kind of the more semi-professional, the path to pro, helping people, focusing on education through esports. So, you know, yeah. I wear a lot of different hats because I'm super passionate about this stuff and I want to make it better and I want to make it work. So uh, is, is there any specific component of that that you'd like me to delve into in my story? Yeah, so let, let's start with this one. Stressful? Yeah, yeah, so like let's, let's start with, I guess, a couple of things. One is, um, you know, how you balance different things. So like there's a particular stress from trying to do more than one thing. Yeah, there is. Yeah, and, and I'm then, really bad at that personally. <laughs> Yeah. So, so what, when you say you're really bad at that, what does that mean? Well, earlier this year, um, like basically that for myself, I was operating for quite a long time, uh, undiagnosed bipolar two, And I didn't realize that that's still something that's relatively new to me and I'm still trying to figure out how to cope with it. But, uh, whenever I would be on the elevated side of bipolar two, um, you know, it wouldn't be like, full-blown mania and you know no delusions of grandeur disassociation nothing like that it was just elevated mood elevated productivity motivation passion like just super energetic all the time and that's one of the reasons that uh if i just like saw a problem or saw something that i could do i just like jump right into it with uh with no regard to my health at all you know there's a lot of people i think do that that get really really passionate or really really competitive and you know, you do hear about these guys grinding eight to 12 hours. And honestly, that's kind of the conservative <laughs> estimate. There's definitely people who push kind of like 16, 20 hour sessions, especially when they're grinding really, really hard. Um, you know, just like the guys here uh, at the Team Canada House, like, you know, we're in person and we're making sure that they're fed and they have you sleep and we're all kind of do go to bed at the same time. But there are some people who play until uh, like four in the morning or something like that. And then they're the first ones up and the first thing they do after they do their morning routine is just hop right back on and keep going. So we've got these really intense days where we're doing, um, you know, three blocks of overwatch and review and prep and discussions. And then they're putting in um, two different sets of our play sessions before and after mm -hmm. uh, the boot camps completely voluntarily. So you know, Jane, I've kinda... got, I've got a question for you. If, yeah. if I wanted to find a, uh, if I had, if I wanted to find, so there's an average rate of bipolar two in the U.S. Mm -hmm. population. And if I wanted to find a group of people that had a rate of bipolar two, three, three times the rate of the average, do you know where I could look? Like, where am I going to find people who, who are three times more likely to have bipolar two? Are you going to say esports? Uh, no, actually Harvard College. Really? Yes. That's Think about that for a second. Yeah, it's uh, I've, I've, like I'm obviously not a professor of psychology, but uh, you know, it's it comes to my, myself. I was uh, went to the military college, and sometimes I see it where people kind of compartmentalize, especially in mission oriented tasks, like people who you know in the military, it's all about the mission. It's like you accumulate stress while you're doing your job or doing what was assigned and you do that. And then afterwards you kind of like decompress and you can just like try and get yourself back to normal. So you can take the same mm -hmm. mission. And I do see that same kind of drive sometimes, um, at least within the realm of esports as well. And that people, especially when they get into the mindset that like they, you know, they need to win. It's not that they want to win. It's not like they want to be the best. They, they want to, win and that's a never-ending mission to them and they really do you know push themselves well past what anyone would consider healthy at least in terms of physical limitations how do you think that affects their their performance um you know this is one of the things that uh, i'm really interested in 
is, I think that it negatively affects their performance quite a bit. You know, you had Super and Sinatra going on The Tonight Show with Jimmy Fallon. And Jimmy Fallon did this really brief kind of super commercialized four minute interview with them. But at the end, he asked them if they had any advice for like people who wanted to also become pro gamers. And then Super's uh, piece of advice was, you know, you need to keep your life in balance. Like, you know, he had a pretty good answer. But then uh, Sinatra kind of added to that. He's like, yeah, but in addition to keeping your life in balance, if you really want to be the best, you need to grind eight to 12 hours a day on top of that. And it was like that math just doesn't work out. So you're having yeah. these kids, you know, like they can get into the Overwatch League on their 18th birthday. And the superstars usually do. But that means that these guys have been grinding this game since they were 15. And they've been spending, you know, 8 to 12 hours, you know, most days of the week grinding to be this good. That's before they start getting on teams. And it's really all they know. And nobody has really taught them life skills or soft skills. Um, And especially when you're looking at like a field uh, like aviation, you know, my background is in the Air Force as a pilot. Um, The stat, I think, the most common stat thrown away is that you would do four hours of prep work for one hour of performance or one hour of flight time. And there is this component where, you know, the eight to 12 hours, it's, it's practice. Yes. But there's also a different say it's where it's like, uh, practice doesn't make perfect. Perfect practice makes perfect. And I think that the Hmm. efficiency and just the way that people are going about trying to improve at the game is really incredibly inefficient. And I feel, you know, even things like drills, review, focused practice on specific areas, different ways of thinking like paradigm shifts rather than, um, what's the best way to explain this? You know, I, I was, I've worked with um, an individual who finished, like didn't finish, I, you know, it's kind of, I would love to see a statistic. It's probably a statistic the league doesn't really want public. But it's the amount of people who either dropped out of high school or who finished high school online. It's kind of like, uh, you know, given easier course loads that you can pursue your passion, whatever it is. That's fine. But, you know, I've had uh, I've worked with pro players who don't know how to take notes, things like that. You know, looking at the game footage and asking them to take notes of things that they want to look at or things that they noticed or something. And like they don't they can't they don't know how. And so, Jane, what, what I'm hearing you say is that, like, people don't know how to learn. Yes. Well, nobody's taught them. You know, learning yeah. is a skill. Problem solving is a skill. The scientific method wasn't developed until the Enlightenment period. Before that, you know, nobody really knew that. It's the same sort of thing. Scientific thinking, uh, learning how to learn, learning how to fail gracefully, learning how to improve, uh, all of those things are not skills that are taught. And right now, there is a significant number of people, I think, who put in so many hours into the game without thinking that they become purely instinctual creatures or machines in the fact that um, if they can do some pretty incredible things and they'll, you know, flank at the right time or do some action that's, uh, you know, something that is like, I don't see the connection that they saw Mm -hmm. in order to actually pull that play off, but they don't either. They just know it was the right thing to do at that time. They can't articulate it. They can't explain it. Something about the context of that play made sense in their brain but it wasn't a focused effort in order to figure out a play and practice it through repetition. It was just kind of like over the multiple thousands of hours I have in this game, I know that this is the right thing to do at this point in time. <laughs> so it's, it's very weird kind of working with, you know, I work in the world where, or I worked previous in the world of standard operating procedures and workflows and things like that, where, you know, flight safety, if a, a plane goes down, we review all of our procedures and you never assume that the pilot is at fault. There's things like, you know, planes themselves are defined, well, designed so, to not only be triple redundant, but also to fly despite the best intentions of the pilots. That's the joke. So if something fails and something goes wrong, we usually blame the training, we blame the workflows, we blame procedures, we well, blame hardware. The last thing we blame so, is the pilots. How, how is that different from esports? <laughs> well, it's, it's almost the exact opposite in the fact that not only do we not blame the training or anything like that, but there is no really defined way or accepted way of training, educating, coaching teams. You know, at the at the league level, sure, some people, what, you know. <laughs> what, is that, what does that blame look like? So, like, let's say that you guys, like, let's say that there's a team that, you know, you guys had a disappointing performance or you guys are scrimming and things aren't going well or, you know, during, like, a particular run or tournament, um, things don't go well. How does that 
how does that look in terms of you know when you say like you blame everything you, in in the air force you guys blame everything except for the pilot and yeah. in esports and this has been my experience as well that a lot of blame falls on individuals there are personality conflicts um players will blame once again they won't blame the system in which they approach things they'll blame each other um organizations will blame players like people will dogpile some players like this is stuff that i've seen like how does that play out i mean you said it yourself all those things have happened i don't want to talk too much about the league level because anytime i talk about the league level people automatically assume that the things that i'm saying are thinly veiled references to the fuel so like I'd okay. like to avoid Fair those enough. topics. I've got a, I've got a lot of friends in both at the player level and at the staff level for other teams. You know, it's we talk. So, we know what's going on on other teams in terms of like the you know it's not like leaking confidential information or vods or anything like that. But uh, you know, people know when people are having a rough time or when there's conflict between uh, individuals, and it's pretty common. Yeah. So let me ask you this then. Then and and thanks for letting me know. You know what's okay or not okay to talk about because I understand that you know at the end of the day you're working for a team and you're trying to be competitive and you're trying to train them to win and, and yeah. you don't want to you know give up that competitive advantage and or talk trash let me ask you this so when you're dealing like is can we ask you a little bit about how you deal with that like as a person like if you notice that people are not like so you have this air force training and yeah. other people are instinctively moving towards like blaming each other how yes. do you how do you try to move people from their way of thinking into this other way of thinking? How or is that propri- in, Do you do you want it? Uh, do you want this theoretical like how I would do it? Because technically, at the league level, I'm an assistant, so there's you know I don't get to fix things myself. Is that my way of thinking? My military background, the way that I would approach these problems, is subservient to Arrow and the fact that I'm there to assist Arrow. So sure. what he says and his approach to the team uh, goes. But then there's times where, like, to get into the league, this is also kind of a, an interesting. Is that a lot of people? Wow, how much of a tangent do I want to go on here? Go on the tangent, baby. Um, go for it. Run. Okay, so run far, far away. There's everybody has a different approach to it. Some players have different approaches to the game. Some coaches have different different plays. And um, they, I cut out there, didn't I? Yeah, just for a second. You're back. Okay. Um, but tier two, looking at it, sometimes feels almost like a lottery in the fact that uh, you know people try and assemble the best ways that they can. But there's a lot of teams at the uh, at the tier two level that just kind of end up player coached. And then it almost feels like the coaches themselves who are attached to the teams are playing lottery. And the fact that when you have eight teams competing, one of them has to win. And if you're the coach of that you know, team that happened to win, even if it was a player coach team, you get to take credit for that victory. <laughs> and then the next tier up kind of looks at you. So there is kind of like there's a lot of uh, almost going through the motions. And that's largely because there is no one accepted way of coaching a team and any kind of team that does feel like they've figured out how to run a team and how to actually work on player development, uh, they're obviously not going to share that information. So player development is something that is talked a lot about, um, but in the league and at the semi-professional player, it, or, and at the semi-professional level, it feels like people are almost playing the lottery or trading stocks where they're kind of, if you're not good enough, they'd rather just trade a player for a better player and then instead of trying to work on that player, develop them, or build them up in order to be, you know, a dynasty of a team. There's very little focus on player development, and it's more of like, if you're not working and there develops interpersonal issues, just get them the hell off my team so that we can start again, start again fresh. Uh, Absolutely. So yeah, this, yeah so, it's, it's, so- this, this knowledge just isn't here. It's not endemic. There's no institutional knowledge. Uh, nothing. So, so you, it, you, you know, know what that sounds actually a lot like? Um, so... Uh, this sounds a lot like investment banking, to be completely yes. honest. No, so that's, investment that's, banking that's pretty much what it is. I- investment banking, for you guys don't know, is a field that has a real problem with retention. So like people go into investment banking, they work crazy hours. And I think it's bizarre how similar investment banking is to esports and is even more similar to esports than actually real sports. So I work with a few NFL players and the NFL is like completely different from esports. So the first thing is that in, in the NFL, you have physical limitations on how much you can practice, right? So like people train for like 
four to six, seven hours a day. The people who work really hard will watch a lot of game tape and things like that. But it's still like basically like an eight or 10 or maybe 12 hour day. But for some people, it's like a four hour day. And people train really hard and, and they're very thoughtful. Um, and especially like good quarterbacks will spend a lot of time like reviewing game tape and things like that. But what this really – and the other thing about the NFL is like you don't have like rampant player trading, right? So you'll have like people will trade and things like that. But generally speaking, like you look at, you know, the NFL is about building dynasties, just like like Jane said. Jane's like, you know, in esports, people don't focus on building dynasties. The NBA is like people like it's about building like a cohesive team that you can run with. Like think about Brady. I mean, I'm from Boston. So Tom Brady and the Patriots is about building like a dynasty, like a team of people that will carry you to win title after title after title after title. And in investment banking, it's actually the complete opposite. So what, what happens is you have a bunch of people who, and I think this happens in esports as well, where you basically have a, an astronomical success curve where like you'll have people who like finish college, right? And they've like, they'll be like, they have essentially no net worth and they'll move to New York City and they'll start making like 200 to 250K a year. And, and within five or seven years, they'll be making 700K, 800K. And then hopefully within a decade or a little over a decade, they're going to be making like seven figures. So just the, 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 the difference between like 22 and 23 is just astronomic. And I see that in esports as well, whereas like you've got this 18 year old kid who's like failing out of call, like school, right? He's like struggling to graduate because he plays a, a game all day, like whether it be LOL or Overwatch or whatever. And then he lands a contract for like 125K a year or 250K a year. And this is a kid who like doesn't have expenses. Like he just sits at home and he plays video games all day. And so that has its own stress. And then what happens is you start to get this sort of situation where like in investment banking, you have a big problem with retention. So people feel like they're undervalued or they feel like they're not being treated or utilized correctly. And so they move. And so banks have a big problem with sort of keeping the good people and losing the bad people. So they want to keep all the people they perceive as good, but the people they perceive as good are going to want to be shopping around a little bit because they feel like they can get a better offer elsewhere. And the flip side of it is they'll fire the people who they think are bad, but then those people will travel to another organization and either do bad there or they'll find a right team. They'll find a different system. They'll find a different approach. They'll have like a manager who's a little bit more compassionate and works on them as a person. And then they'll rise to the top and they'll do really well. So there's kind of this bizarre situation where people are like looking at a system plus a person and they're making a judgment about the person instead of like thinking at all about the system. Because that, because generally speaking in investment banking, like people are, are you know, there's a bell curve, but like most people are pretty good. And I've seen so much variance even within an individual person. Like if you stick one person, their work product on a particular team is going to be way better than the work product on another team. And that's because of the way that the team functions, like the way that the reporting structure functions, the way that... So I'll give you guys just one really simple example. So when you have a junior team member... Sometimes senior people will schedule important meetings without them. And one of the simplest things you can do in investment banking to get the most out of your junior people is just not leave them out. Like it's such a simple thing, but it like happens so rarely where I was talking and, and just include the junior people on your team. And then they feel like they're a part of the team instead of feeling like they're like a, a monkey who's just there like building financial models in the basement for you. And then they're going to give you that extra mile and your team will do way better. But a lot of people in banking just don't think about that. They're just like, oh, I wasn't invited to meetings when I was a junior person. So I'm going to ignore my junior person. And, and, like, and then they start complaining when this person doesn't seem to be doing a good job because you haven't inspired them to work. And that sounds a lot like what you're describing. Where people yeah. find like, go ahead. No, it, it can. Yes, yes. I was just agreeing with you. Keep going. Yeah, so I mean, I think one thing to just remember, um, which which uh, I really come to appreciate is that if you want to get the most out of a team member or employee, just remember that two like people value two things: people want to be appreciated and people want to be utilized. And I think that like one of the biggest problems is that like when people don't feel like they want to be pushed, they want to be challenged, 
they want to feel like they're doing like the best work that they can do and they want to be like they want to feel appreciated for doing that and anytime i see like a leader do those two things for their employees they do really really well and when one of those two things is missing i.e not not pe- keeping junior people not loving the letting them live up to their potential and then not expressing gratitude leads to problems yeah one of the one of the things it sounds like in your examples and one of the things that i've kind of identified as one of the pro- main problems that uh, causes interpersonal issues to arrive especially on the more competitive teams is just a lack of empathy for teammates it seems to be uh, the case you know it's when you grind rank so much especially at the higher levels you kind of become psychologically ingrained when you're a professional player to you know be that you are better than every one of your teammates and every one of your opponents and th- uh, resources need to be funneled into you in order to be successful you know this happens when you have grandmasters top 500s and pro players getting getting put into games with like masters players or something there's you know when you approach that last edge of the bell curve every little tiny improvement is a massive you know exponential increase in both skill and knowledge um and i feel like a lot of pro players and semi-pro players really really struggle to get out of that mindset because they have put so many hours into the rank ladder before they actually transition into the competitive mindset uh on a team and when you do that, out of all of the issues, out of everything that's gone wrong, when you see kind of teams going up and down, swinging dramatically, it's uh, uh, usually it comes down to kind of trust, communication, teamwork, and just confidence in the ability to win. I thought it was so funny that the Houston Outlaws, which had a, like a really, really rough year here, pretty much as soon as the uh, it was announced that they were being sold, like the organization was being sold to Immortals, they like won some games. And it was it was... To me, you know, nothing else changed on the team. But it's like, hooray, we're being sold. Maybe to somebody who actually has money. And like that, you know, maybe it gave the players hope or confidence and when they were feeling stuck otherwise that. But just that kind of like mental shift uh, might have been enough to like get them to win some games. And no, that's complete speculation. I don't know anything on the inside. But, you know, that lack of empathy for trying to understand something from another person's perspective, especially treating teammates as equals, isn't something that is very common. It's actually quite quite rare i think within the overwatch league itself that infuriates me well like because because that (laughs) yeah i mean i I like not to say i'm not blaming anyone but i I think like the thing that infuriates me is that that the theme of i think our or i I guess the view that jane you and i share is that things can be taught yes absolutely you can everything can be taught and and so i think a big part of of what i do is i i try to teach people how to be empathic Like I try to teach people and I think this is where, you know, the yogis realize that like just about everything about the mind, any faculty of the mind or anything that a human being can do can be understood and improved so that our capacity for empathy, our capacity for creativity, our capacity for concentration, you're talking about we're we're not taught how to learn. Absolutely. We're also not taught how to concentrate. That's just something we just kind of take for granted. Like, oh, like. I'm having trouble concentrating on studying for this test. I guess I'll try again later. Like, no one ever looks at, like, why am I having trouble concentrating? How do you actually concentrate? How do you train your mind to focus? How do you elicit a flow state? How do you learn how to be empathic? How do you learn to dissolve your ego? So I'm developing a... Collaborative problem solving. That's the the collaborative problem solving is the most difficult one. That like, that's, that's a difficult one to teach people. You know, so, it's especially because you can solve problems that are binary, like, should we do this? Yes or no. But like the, the classic problem that always disrupts a team. And, and like, you know, if, if you as a team had, can figure out whether or not it was the composition that is the problem or the execution of that uh, composition. So if you kind of if your coach presents a new composition and you run that composition and you lose, the argument always arises whether or not the composition was wrong or whether the execution was wrong. And one of the things that it just seems to just not be in people's heads, it's all, it's, what is it called? It's not a uh, two, not two factor problem, but it's, it doesn't have to be one or the other. Both mm-hmm. of them can exist, but people will always try and you're, you're, they're going to split and it's going to be tribal. It's like, you know, we just need to play the comp better or, you know, we need to change the comp. We executed it fine. Like, first of all, you never executed anything perfectly. And even if the composition was good, it's going to change and shift in a week anyway, because that's what the meta is like while people are developing and so, iterating on each other's weaknesses. Yeah. Jane, you know what the fascinating thing is? 
there there is a very clear neuroscience reason why that happens. And there are also very clear neuroscience ways. So there are cer- certain circuits in your brain that activate that cause you to be black and white. So like when, when our limbic system and our stress system activates, our brain is designed to think in terms of black and white. So normally, like when we calmly approach a problem, like we're talking about this and we're sort of appreciating all these shades of gray. And I think your main point is that it's not like strategy or execution. There are elements of both, yeah, right? Always. And, and but what happens is people say like, oh, like we had the, uh, by composition, I assume you mean on a more general sense, strategy, right? Like what your comp is going into the game? Yes. yes. Yeah. And then, and then execution, you can maybe think about as tactics or just how people played. And so the fascinating thing is when people get stressed out, their mind shuts off the ability to appreciate shades of gray. And that's actually a survival mechanism. So when we're, when we're faced with stress, our body like thinks we're under attack. And when it thinks we're under attack, we don't want to appreciate shades of gray. We want to make snap judgments and like go like all in on one thing or another thing. Like when we're faced with a tiger in the jungle, we want to go into, do we run or do we fight? Everything in between is completely irrelevant. And for the human beings who sat and appreciated nuance and shades of gray when they faced a tiger, you know what happened to them? They died. Absolutely. <laughs> Nom. <laughs> they, just, they just got gobbled. And so what happens is over millions of years of evolution, our brain is designed to be like tribal or black and white thinking. And the cool thing is that there are many ways that you can actually disable that circuit of your brain. So one thing you can do is like actually reduce the cortisol level in your body because cortisol is going to encourage black or white thinking and cortisol is a, a stress hormone. This is also really fascinating. So adrenaline is so when, when people get heated and they start to argue and they start like saying like, oh, it was composition. Oh, it was execution. So anytime you start arguing, your adrenaline level is going to go up. Your cortisol level is going to go up. And this is fascinating. So adrenaline actually causes your peripheral vision to collapse. So our normal field of vision is 180 uh-huh. degrees. When we have adrenaline in our system, our field of vision reduces down to 30 degrees. Like our physically, you can't see anything except for what's in front of you. And the fascinating thing is that correlates, in my opinion, there are fewer studies about this, to psycho- psychologically as well. And you're unable to see like your peripheral vision when you get pissed off. And you zero in on one problem and you collapse to like a 30 degree field of vision. And then all you can see is what's in front of you. Oh, the problem is this other guy. And you can't see anything else. And the really fascinating thing is when I work with especially groups of people, like I also work with resident physicians. So this is a class of people that is sort of like, you know, is the the nuts and bolts of like what's running the hospital. So myself and my co-residents, like we're running, like we're the ones who are taking all the call shifts. So one of us is working every night or two of us are working every night to cover a 960 bed hospital. And so what, like, there's all kinds of stuff that happens, like in terms of the person that you're on with, like, if you feel like they're not pulling your weight, you're going to feel swamped. Or if you feel swamped, you reverse engineer the answer and you say, oh, that guy's not pulling his weight because I feel swamped, right? Like yeah. there's, there's like kind of this dyad. And if, if you feel stressed, you're going to automatically like blame the other person for your stress. And then you get into all kinds of other things. Like if one person calls in sick, that stresses everyone else. So there's a fascinating thing that happens in residency that if one person calls in sick, it makes everyone else more likely to call in sick. Yeah. Because if I have to do extra work because someone else is sick, well, fuck that. I'm going to call in sick too. And it gets to the point, the worst thing that I've ever seen is that when, when people start calling in sick, people start pretending to call in sick to fucking go to concerts. That happened once in my class, and I was livid when I found out. We didn't say anything about it, but like someone's like, well, fuck, I got called in, so like other people can get called in too. And yep. it can become super, super toxic so fast. So what do you do about that, Jane? Uh... What can I say in that regard? Because um, I don't want to talk about league-specific experience. Okay, sure. So let, let's switch gears for a second. So I, I, I appreciate that. Um, 
So let me ask you this, uh, and if you're if you're comfortable talking about this. So you said that you were diagnosed with something like bipolar two. As far um, as yeah. I don't yeah, know so like, how you get like a 100% confirmation that that's the case, but it's the working yeah. theory and it seems to fit pretty well so far. Yeah, so I, I think that actually a lot of people like resonated with that actually on, on Twitch chat. And I was kind of mm-hmm. curious, what w- what were you experiencing? Because I think a, a big problem that a lot of people face is that, you know, people think that something that's happening to them is normal. And in a sense it is because that's just how they've been their entire life. Like yeah. your entire yes. life, I would guess that you've just had periods of time of like, superhuman productivity that Mm -hmm. other people have even been envious of and then your body has had to like tip like there's that balancing effect right so after a period of superhuman productivity you kind of like your body has to crash and that's just who you are it's the way that you've always worked and so people don't realize that like just because you're working that way there's a way to understand that there's a way to actually capitalize on that there's a way to balance that there's a way to optimize it there's a way to take advantage of it, and there's a way to like suffer less. Oh, certainly. The like the hypomania side of bipolar too is, uh, despite being a mental illness, as by definition or something like that, it is very beneficial in cases. You know, it it, it does, as you describe it, it is superhuman productivity. One of the things is that uh, when I was first trying to kind of understand the whole bipolar two nature, um, and you know, I'm trying to deal with it just through self regulation and healthy living. Um, instead of, I don't want to like medicate myself. I want to understand it, understand my brain and all that. So, but the hypomania side, um, when I was working on it, I was having, um, when I stepped back from social media, I was having some pretty crippling social anxiety, which is really strange because, you know, I've given thesis presentations in front of the prime minister of Canada and like never been nervous about that before. So for me to get anxiety and like worry about things, it was like, this was new. It was, that's fucking not usually an anxious person. Can Um, we just pause and appreciate how cool that is? It was the military college. It wasn't anything. <laughs> um, that sounds but, fucking uh, cool, man. It, like, yeah, the fourth year. What project, was your thesis? Uh, Not I to derail by, you, but I can't help myself. I studied aeronautical engineering at the Royal Military College of Canada. And the fourth year thesis in that program is to design an aircraft. So what we did was we took uh, a look at one of the current platforms that the uh, Air Force used, and we redesigned it for modern times in a way that... I, a company could take and actually produce it. And I was the aerodynamicist on that project. That's cool. It, anyway. Yeah, and now I'm playing esports. So. <laughs> That's but, awesome. Um, yeah. So on the, when I was working with, uh, with, working with my therapist to try and figure out what was going on with this anxiety, one of the things is that I, I had, well, let's start back on like what bipolar, bipolar 2 looked like to me and why I didn't um, figure out that I was bipolar, like why I couldn't tell. And why I never like realize it because you know I say this to other people and they're like, oh yeah, that makes sense. And like you know, people looking at me uh, and me not looking in the mirror, it makes sense to them. But um, so I always thought that bipolar, as it was described, was something where it was like an instantaneous shift of mood, like mid conversation. I always thought that that was why people had trouble dealing with bipolar individuals because in the middle of a conversation they'd go like really happy or really sad or something like that. I didn't realize that bipolar happened over the course of numerous days or uh, weeks, or in some cases, months, and that you can have these dramatic mood shifts uh, more gradually like that. Um, but yeah, the stress of the Overwatch League itself started to compress the, uh, the frequency of my mm. mood swings quite, quite badly. Um, so by and- compress the frequency, let's just, let's just pause. So what that means is that you started to fluctuate more quickly due to stress. Yes. Yeah, that's what it was. Um, okay. And it, became, and it became a big problem. Uh, and then so after that whole situation, which I'm just going to skip, um, uh, what had happened is that I was having like massive amounts of anxiety, and I couldn't figure out why. Jane, can I, was- I ask you to pause for just one second? You're on an awesome rhythm, but there's yeah. so much that you're talking about, which I think is just so it's like a gold mine for people. I, I want to <laughs> grab just I want to grab like a notebook real quick, and I just want to jot down a couple of things which I want to talk or ask about. Okay. So, yeah, and it's just too good to pass up. So I have to interrupt you, even though I feel like that's criminal. Also, I'm going to just grab something to drink real quick. I'll be right back. Go nuts.
All right, because I think like this, what you're saying, so this is, you're absolutely correct um, about, you know, people really misunderstand how quickly and how slowly bipolar fluctuates. And a lot of people think that bipolar is like someone who has like mood swings, but that's not what bipolar is. And that's a really important point that I just don't want to lose along with everything else you're saying. Uh Um, Okay. Anyway, please continue. So I was, uh, um, I was, when I came back from my break and I started to try and work with uh, Dallas again in stage four, um, I was having anxiety attacks and panic attacks. And they were really kind of weird in the fact that I would feel them coming. Like it was just something I could feel my body chemistry shift. And I could be like, oh, here we go. And I'd have to go over to my general manager and be like, hey, I need to go to my apartment. I'm about to have a panic attack. Or I don't know what the difference between anxiety attack or panic attack is. I just know it's like shit. That's what it did. Um, so he'd help me. We'd go to my apartment and I'd kind of wait for it all to blow over. But working through the therapist, what I, what I had realized is basically that um, I had been kind of locked into the depressive state for a while. And I had con- kind of considered that to be my normal. And then when the, I stepped back and I de-stressed and I self-regulated again, started being healthier, um, I, my body was trying to go into the hypomanic state, move out of depression. But I hadn't been there for so long. Um, I was fighting against the mood correction into the positive territory. Oh, when um, you say fighting you know, against, what does that mean? It's so this uh, bipolar two. I still I, I'm aware of my mood and in control of my mood. So it's not like I ever lost control or awareness over my actions or anything like that. And the fact mm-hmm. that you know, if I was like super happy and excited and I wanted to just dance in the middle of the room, like I could just sit there and be like a normal person and pretend to be a professional, you know. So like so things of that variety is that, you know, despite my, my body wanting to basically stand up and dance, I could force myself to sit in that chair and do work. Um, but that's, so you were having, you were having like these like impulses and you would control the impulses. It's it's, impulses. It doesn't sound like the right word to me at all. It's just kind of like, I would just, I had energy. Okay. And, and I wanted to, you know, I was energetic and wanted to do something a little bit more stimulating than, whatever I was doing at the okay. time, basically. Um, and then fighting against that is what uh, the therapist suggested might have been causing the anxiety. So uh, she suggested that basically I stop trying to fight that and just like, you know, be okay with whatever state of energy my body wants to be at. And so I did the next time I felt an anxiety attack coming on. I'm like, by the way, your okay. therapist is very good. Yeah, she is. <laughs> Thank you, Dallas. But um, yeah, so I just, let it ride. I let the anxiety attack ride. I didn't try and fight it. I wasn't worried about it. And then what had happened is that after that, that's the first time that I entered a hypomanic state again. Um, and I worked for like 35 hours straight, which was not healthy. And my therapist did not like that. But I was like, I was having a blast. And I must have gotten like two weeks worth of, worth of work done in like 35 hours. And then I basically like collapsed. Physically, I gave out. Mentally, I was I uh, just wanted to keep working. Um, so that was kind of like the first time that was the kind of realizing what the anxiety was. It was like my body wanted to be happy, but I'd been unhappy for so long that uh, I was fighting against it. So and since then, like I've been putting a lot of that energy into uh, self-regulating, working out, eating healthier. Like, you know, it is kind of nice when I post a photo on Instagram, like people are like, wow, you're looking good. It's like, yeah, I've got all this energy. And I kind of realized that uh, living. You do look good, my- by the way. Thank you. Living with compared to the last time I saw you, <laughs> yes, <laughs> you look but so much living, better. Thank you. Um, living with your face has something called ojas in it. Ojas? Uh, something weird is happening. Can you still hear me? Yeah. So you have something okay. called ojas. Um, I, I don't understand. Something weird just happened in my Twitch chat, but. Uh, so Ojas is like glow is how it gets translated. So you have like a glow in your face, like, Hmm. and you look, it it wasn't there last time. Yeah. We'll talk about that, but it's, it's, it's been, well, the last time you saw me was, yeah, probably right in the middle of that. So, um, where was I? Uh, oh, basically like when I am in a, like a hypomanic state and being really productive, uh, it feels like I'm a candle burning from both ends and that I can feel the physical pull 
uh, being that productive takes on me. The fact that I'm pretty aware that if I let myself work at maximum capacity, that I shorten my lifespan. There's no real other way to put it. So I've been, in order to, my way of co-regulating has kind of been putting that energy into keeping myself alive by staying healthy, making sure I'm working out and eating and, you know, introspection, meditation, things like that. But it's been a, a marked increase in quality of life. Yeah. So I'm going to, I want to ask you a question, but um, I need to figure out how do I turn off the sound for gift subs? Because someone just gifted a hundred subs. I don't know what wow. that means. Okay. But that's I, a, it looks okay. it looks significant, but I gotta figure out can somebody help me? Do you have yeah, a I'm, do you have a do you have a browser source on OBS? I don't know what that means. All right, well, what are you using to stream? Streamlabs I'm using OBS Streamlabs OBS. OBS. So you'll find it in one of the I don't know Streamlabs OBS specifically, but look at one of the sources and you should be able okay. to mute a source individually. Uh, um, I don't know. Okay. Who is it? I'm going to open your Twitch stream. <laughs> it's this guy named Low DPM. So at first I thought it was a hack because like when someone starts spamming all that shit in my Twitch, yeah. it means someone is hacking. Streamlabs.com. I'm so sorry, guys. I, like, Jane, this is just pure gold, man. You're just, your journey is so good. Like, I, I think it's, um, uh, I was unable to find that person. So, like, the problem is my thing is, like, dinging every few seconds. Oh, yeah, it's not the person. It's, it'll have sent to Streamlabs, and Streamlabs is sending you those alerts. So, you can, it's not Twitch, like, you can't do anything with Twitch either. You have to do it through the Streamlabs dashboard on the browser. Or in the uh, Streamlabs OBS streaming program itself. Okay, let me see. Find the uh, browser source for it. Okay, or you I, could I'm going to log yeah. into Streamlabs. Also, just for this the guy is... who actually did donate the 100 subs, thank you so much. I'll yeah, just... I mean, I, I thank you. That's I'm, a lot I'm, of support. It's huge. And I think, I think uh, Jane, thank you. Because I think, like, what... So, I, like, I think what you're sharing right now is so important. Um, okay, hold on. Did this stop? We done? Okay. I think we're so thank you very much for everyone who subscribed and followed. I, I don't get a chance to thank you guys enough. And I think Jane, like honestly, like this story is so classic and is brilliant. Um so thank you so much for sharing it. I, I didn't mean to derail you by talking about or just, but I'm getting really excited because I think you're you're doing this in such an awesome way. Like the way that first of all, the way that you discovered this, the way that you recognize that this is actually who you've been your entire life. And there's so many elements to this. Like, I, I don't want to cut you off, but you were saying that, um, you know, people are saying that you're looking better now. So so tell us a little bit about how you're doing now. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's just like, so I've been like, you know, ever since I kind of figured out this and I've actually been able to self-regulate a little bit. Um, I haven't actually been on the downside of bipolar since August 18th now. So I'm over two months maintaining kind of like positive mood state, which is I like it. Um, are you and, hypomanic or are you just kind of normal? Yes. No, hypomanic. Yeah, hypomanic okay. for two months now. Yeah. How much are you sleeping every night? Uh, about five hours usually. So it does. Yeah, that's always the first question. So uh, at first it was down to three hours just because the energy persisted even through dreams, which is really weird and wonky. But uh, since then, since I've been able to actually kind of through meditation, be able to self-regulate a little bit more, uh, you know, five hours, five, six hours is probably average. And then you know, if I really push myself, then yeah, if I like, if I exhaust myself, then we can sleep for a normal eight hours or so. Okay. So I think um, there are a couple of things that I want to ask you. So the first is, so I'm noticing that you're kind of attached to your bipolar two. Does that make it's sense? Been, it's yes. And it's been that way because, oh my goodness, come on, Discord. Uh, because it's been kind of the starting point for me to figure out things that have actually made marked improvements. You know, it's, uh, I've always been very uh, cautious against self-diagnosis, you know, <laughs> at the same time, it's, I know that the, the DSM and diagnostic manuals. Um, so I was very kind of honest with my therapist, be like, you know, like, what is this? What are you thinking? Like, mm -hmm. you know, don't give me the Coles notes motions. Like, what do you actually think? Just speak honestly sort of thing. But uh, yeah, the reason that uh, I kind of refer to bipolar two and hypomania as much as I do is just because 
in looking at how it was treated and reading stories about how other people have managed it, I've found clues that have helped me live a better life. So it's not like I, I don't like to identify. I don't think I've ever actually mentioned hypomania on my own social medias before. I mentioned bipolar 2 once in a YouTube video, and I specifically mm. mentioned then that I didn't want to be known as the guy with bipolar. So like, I don't make any public references to it. This is just because you are uh, who yeah. you are is why I mention well, it so much. Yeah, so I, I, I'm i glad you do, because I think the first thing to recognize, it's funny, so like, um, you, you know a guy named Devin Nash, by chance? I don't know. Okay, so I, I, I was, he's uh, he's also like, a, he was CEO of Counterlogic Gaming a couple of years ago, and so is still like sort of in the esports kind of realm. Um, <laughs> but, uh, so I was talking to Devin on Friday, and the really fascinating thing is that like, so we were talking about his sense of inadequacy. And he really is attached to his sense of inadequacy because he feels like it's responsible for his success and that his yeah. inadequacy fuels him forward because he, he's never like satisfied with himself and that that causes him to move forward. And I think the the really fascinating thing that I've noticed about working with people who have, I don't really like to call it mental illness. I, I think it's just a part of them, right? So like when yeah. I work with people with anxiety, they too, like they don't want to lose their anxiety. And the people who are the most attached to their quote unquote mental illness are actually people with bipolar too. Yeah, because well, they don't want to I give there's, up. There's, there's there's quite a few people out there who credit hypomania to their success in their field or their career. It's not, I, you know, at, at least from my own research, that's not a, a unique experience. It's that it's, it, le legitimately it does make me more productive. Um, not and not only is it a legitimate, not only is it an uncommon experience, I would argue it is like a very common experience. And yeah. and once again, when we're talking about undergrads at Harvard College, like they are there because of their bipolar two. Yeah. They are there because they can go two months sleeping four hours a night and study their asses off. And enjoy and, it. And enjoy it because they feel great. And then when the other shoe falls, you know, they feel awful, awful their productivity drops, but they're still able to sustain it just like you have. Like I'm I'm hearing that you needed to take a break from time to time, and it's it also sounds like you've been sort of struggling with this cycle for many years, and yet you have become overwhelmingly professionally successful. Like you were in the Air Force, you're you know you've been in esports. Like you can't you can't drop off the face of the earth for like two months in esports and have a job when you come back. You just can't. So you manage the lows, or maybe I'm making assumptions, but I, I don't. I mean that hasn't been my experience because you've just. I mean the league is two years old. So to like yeah. drop off the face of things for like 5% of the time that the league has been ex in existence, I don't think you can job. Yeah, I so, could do it because I'm, I'm large enough that, you know, I can come back. It's like my spot isn't, you okay. know, I'm no, I'm no longer competing for my spot. So I literally can disappear off social media for two months and then come back. But uh, for, you know, for most people who are still on yeah. the grind, I, I so, don't really so consider the, myself on the grind anymore. You know, the I've first thing things to do, but I'm not competing against others at this point. Yeah, so that's that's actually a wonderful stress free sort of way at looking at things. That's something that I'd like to dive into, but I just have too many things written down in my notebook. So the okay. first thing that I I kind of want to let people understand is that a lot of the negative things we experience in our mind, and a lot of the things that actually cause us suffering and difficulty, actually like help us out in a very important way. So. You know, anxiety in a weird way is like a protective mechanism, right? Because it keeps you from getting hurt. So like if, if you're giving a presentation, let's say to the prime minister of Canada and you have social anxiety, you don't want to look like an idiot in front of the prime minister of Canada so you don't speak. But in a weird way, like that's actually helping you out. Like it's protecting you from looking like an idiot in front of the prime minister of Canada. For people who have bipolar two, their periods of hypomania allow them to work for 35, uh, 35 hours at a stretch really sounds a little bit more like mania, but the, the standard, the standard, you know, bipolar two sort of pattern is like sleeping five hours a night and being like pretty damn productive while you're awake, right? So normally like most human beings and some people can get, get by with like four to six hours of sleep, but mo most human beings need a, a solid eight hours. And if they get less than that, their productivity really drops. Um, so the first thing I want people to understand is that like in the same way that that Jane and I were talking about black and white thinking, like as bizarre as this sounds, I'm not saying that mental illness is a good thing in any way, but at the same time, understand that a lot of your negative mental patterns are doing something for you. 
even if we look at something like video game addiction, video game addiction is doing something for you. That's why you do it so much, right? People who are addicted to video games and escape from the world through playing video games, like that's what it's doing. It's protecting you from the consequences of the real world. And so the first thing, and, and Devin's inadequacy is fueling him towards material success. So the first thing to understand is that, you know, we classify mental illness as all bad. And I, I'm not saying that people should go around trying to be bipolar. I'm not saying that I think you can be free from anxiety. Like that's what I work towards. And at the same time, understand that it's like not all a negative thing and that it's usually doing something for you. In some cases, like schizophrenia or, or you know, really bad depression, I find it hard to understand exactly what it's doing for you. Um, but, you know, for, for a lot of people, like if you have some kind of mental pattern, like we had someone else on a couple weeks ago who was talking about how they always end up dating someone who's emotionally like, uh, no, sorry, like so who's someone like their, their parents and they're sort of like emotionally unavailable. And that can be the kind of thing that feels painful and causes suffering and is actually doing something for you. So what I really like about your story, Jane, is that you're acknowledging that like, even though this has been a struggle for you and it's been hard and not that it's good, but that you recognize that there are parts of this that you really don't want to give up, right? Yes, that's correct. So I'm getting also a lot of questions about, um, you know, what's true bipolar versus mood swings. And I think you opened up with this, which was awesome. So people toss around the word bipolar. And you were saying that, you know, you didn't realize that bi bipolar is something that happens. The mood shift happens over the course of days or even weeks. You were kind of envisioning someone who's like really happy one minute and is like throwing shit the next minute. Yeah. And, and, and I was envisioning also somebody who is hard to communicate with or was like socially awkward. And I do not consider myself that kind of person. So that was another reason, at least in my head. I was like, oh, if you have mood swings, that must make you like, you know, not very much fun at parties or, you know, yeah, struggle absolutely. in the work environment or things like that. But no, not yeah. at all. That's a great point, right? So we also have conceptions of what mental health looks like. And since we don't feel like the stuff on TV looks, we think that that's not really what's going on. So like, even when you look at like schizophrenia, for example, on, on TV, like it's perceived in a very particular way or like, um, you know, even stuff like addiction is like perceived in like a very like kind of almost like glamorous way. Like it's like really high highs and really low lows and like this really like noble struggle against addiction. Whereas for the most part, addiction is like a slog. It's like just really fucking boring. Like if you, if you made a TV show about someone with addiction, it would be like them waking up, maybe going to a job, maybe not going to a job, coming home and then feeding their addiction. It's Leo and it's like just like from West Wing. It's yeah. So it's not Leo McGarry for West from West Wing, right? Like no. Leo, <laughs> no, no, because Leo McGarry is like he's like it's a noble, it's a noble. Like they don't actually show him. So if you want to really see, that's a great example. So if you want to see the real, like what addiction really looks like, it would be six seasons of West Wing where Leo McGarry is sitting in a room and drinking alcohol every episode. That's what real addiction looks like. Leo McGarry is a noble guy who's productive and has this kind of romanticized struggle with addiction where they show this really powerful scene where he's like drinking and relapses and stuff like that. And his friends kind of come in and support him. Real addiction is just fucking boring to watch. Just fucking boring. Like, think about people who are addicted to video games. Like, that's not glamorous. You just wake up every day and you start, like, you're queuing for Overwatch and you just play Overwatch all day. And then, like, you switch to Dota and you switch to LOL. Then you go to sleep and then you wake up and you do it the next day. It's not romanticized at all. And in that same way, so kind of, I, I think I've, so, sorry for going off on a tangent, but what I wanted to share with okay. people is, like, so, so one of the biggest things that I think Jane learned, which is very important to understand, is that bipolar doesn't mean mood swings. So a lot of people, like I, I hear people like come into my office and they'll say like, oh, my, my son is bipolar. So it'll be like a parent. And bipolar, that means that he'll be like playing video games one minute and the next minute he's like throwing shit because they like unplug his internet. That's not bipolar. <laughs> That's not. So bipolar doesn't mean mood swings. So mood reactivity is a different thing. So there are some people who have like very high degrees of mood reactivity. So their mood can swing from like one, one thing to another thing over the course of five minutes or an hour or two hours. Bipolar in depression is persistent periods of mood that last, in the case of bipolar, one week or more. Like pretty much most days, all day, every day kind of thing. 
or in the case of depression, like two weeks at a stretch. So if you're super depressed for a weekend and are fine on Monday morning, like that's not major depressive disorder. That's not clinical depression. That's not really bipolar. So true depression or bipolar involve periods of mood that last days at a time, or even weeks or even months, up to about a year in the case of depression. That's one thing. So mood swings, different. Um, the second thing that I wanted to point out is that it sounds like you've had this pattern for your entire life, and also that certain things you use the word stress from Overwatch compressed the swings. Mm -hmm. that's, so can you? That's my best guess. That's not something that uh, you know. I don't know if there was any other sort of physiological changes that caused the uh, you know the fluctuations to accelerate, but uh, that's at least as far as I can uh, uh, tell what caused it to accelerate there. Uh, and so, then, yeah, it's, go ahead. I'm going to just say this once, and I'll say it a thousand more times. If you think something is going on, chances are you're right. So one of the biggest lessons that I've learned as a psychiatrist is I can train as much as I want to. I can read as many books or studies of, as much as I want to. And if a patient walks into my office and they say, I think this is what's going on, like 90% chance that's what's going on. And so, like, sure, there could be, like, weird neuroscience or physiologic things, but because what I've realized is that most people, like, actually, like, have a good instinct for, like, what's going on with themselves. And so stress absolutely does cause these things to worsen. And in terms of worsen, there are a couple of different dimensions in which stress can cause things to worsen. One is that it can make your lows lower. It can make your highs higher. It can make them more calcified and harder to move, or it can accelerate the, the cycling process. Mm -hmm. And the cycling process is essentially like a, a, an attempt to balance. And if you think about like, you know, if you, let's say like you're, you're like sailing a boat and then you get hit by a huge wave, which is like a stress, and then your boat starts to rock. And if you try to like overcompensate, you're going to make things worse. And then you're overcompensating again. And it's almost like, you know, when people say that if you lose control of a car, you should like go in the direction of the skid. Because if you, if you go against the skid, you're going to just like, you're going to fishtail and you're going to like actually end up worse, right? Mm -hmm. So the really fascinating thing is when our, when our body goes under a period or our brain goes under a period of stress, sometimes our body tries too hard to overcompensate. We try too hard to control things and it just makes things worse. Which is why I think that your therapist is so fucking brilliant, because what she said is that like your anxiety or panic is actually coming is a manifestation of inappropriately dealing with something else. Yes. That you have this excessive energy, which needs to come out and you're not letting it come out. And since it can't go out one way, it's going to blow a gasket somewhere over here. That's, yes, so that's like, I want exactly you guys. What was happening. Yeah. So I want you guys to envision, so envision Jane like a closed system that has pressure building up. And he's got this impulse, like he's got this pressure valve on this one side, which is to get up and dance. And that's what he wants to do. And if you don't open that pressure valve and the pressure in the system keeps building up, like what's going to happen, Jane? <laughs> Increased heart rate. You know, you're going to start fidgeting. You're going to start having frantic thoughts. Yeah. yeah, and your system is going to blow a gasket somewhere else. Like, if you don't let that pressure out, it's going to manifest somewhere else. And I'll give you guys, like, another great example of this. So, I, I had a, um, one of my teachers once taught me something really awesome about depression, which is that the source of depression is anger turned against the self. And that, that depression really, like, finds its roots in, like, anger towards yourself. And when you can't express that anger towards yourself, when you can't metabolize or process that anger about yourself, it transforms into depression. Uh, and in your yeah, case, I, go ahead. I, I can just tell you the cause of mine. Uh, you know, I keep talking about being a pilot in the Air Force, but in my final year of university, uh, I was hit by a car at night. It was a hit and run. I got injured and I ended up oh, shit. out in my, uh, la my last year. And then because I was at the military college, not only did that uh, lose my trade, but also my degree. So that was kind of the cause of, you know, it was, and I was angry at myself for having failed. That yeah, was, right. That was the cause of mine. Yeah. Which is, which is crazy because like you got hit by someone, right? 
And yet yeah. somehow you, you get angry at yourself and that anger sort of like in an alchemical process, like gets transmuted into depression. Mm-hmm. And so something about sort of this internal energy that you had got like alchemically transmuted into anxiety. Um, so yeah, like I said, this is just pure gold for me. So the the next thing is, is you were saying like, you're not sure what the difference between anxiety and panic is. So I'm going to just talk for a second about that. Okay. So anxiety is generally like worrying about stuff. So when I think about anxiety, like I think like I, so my, my classic question for whether someone has anxieties, I just ask them, are you a worrier? So Jane, are you a worrier? No. Not, I don't mean warrior. Usually. I mean like W-O-R-R-I-E-R. Yeah, no, I usually don't worry about things. I just do. Yeah, this. so if you worry about stuff, then chances are you're, you're going to be prone to anxiety. Yeah. Oh, 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 warrior is different. Warrior and warrior. See, if I use the accent, it is easier to understand. <laughs> um, and so what we think about is panic is usually discrete episodes. So like people who have anxiety generally like worry all the time. Like you were talking about social anxiety, right? So yes. like those are like if you're if you become socially anxious, like if you're in the right setting, like your mind is just going to be worrying somewhat constantly. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Whereas panic is usually like a discrete episode of you know, can last an hour or maybe even two of like highly elevated heart rate, like sweating, stuff like that. You can get that in social anxiety as well. But panic is sort of like episodic in nature. And and anxiety is generally like is a more general like experience over a prolonged period of time. Um Yeah, so that's what I that's 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 what I got. Yeah, so from from that definition it would have been uh, social anxiety, just general, tolerable. Yeah. And then it there would have been panic attacks that were happening. Yeah, absolutely. So I think I think the word attack is actually really good because that implies like an episode. So when people talk about mm-hmm. Having having panic attacks, yeah. So it's like a discrete period of of um, you know, really strong, like overwhelming emotions in that moment. So I'm gonna ask. Uh, so Jane, anything else you want to mention, or any questions that you have? I mean, it's a the story spans months, so no, it's wherever you want to go. So I was actually thinking maybe we could do some Q and A, and we'll see if people have questions for you or me. And um, the other thing that I want to do is, is I want to teach some meditation today. And um, uh, I just let me, I've got, I've got 13 minutes. Okay, most. perfect. So let's do questions. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to see, so let's see if people have questions for Jane. Let's start there. And then I'll do meditation afterward. And thanks for coming on, by the way. My pleasure. You know, it's something like this that happens to me. I just know that I'm not uh, unique in this regard. And I, 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 I see a world where we are giving these young kids who don't know much about the world, don't have soft skills, aren't learning psychology, aren't, you know, being introspective or really kind of caring about themselves, that either they're going to go through uh, these breakdowns and similar struggles or they're going to leave the league and something like, you know, maybe they have one really successful year and they sacrifice everything to get where they are and then, you know, I don't know what the stat in the, with the NBA of all the players going bankrupt after they left, but uh, I do think that, uh, you know, I've, I've been almost using the term dream harvester. It's kind of like, you know, people are sacrificing a lot for their dreams, and even when they get them, it might not be uh, what's good for them. So I want to kind of make sure that uh, mental health, especially in esports, is something that's talked more about, and that, uh, you know, so that when people do kind of run into these sort of uh, times in their lives that they are either more well prepared for it or at least have resources that they can go to to try and self-educate um what does malding mean mad plus balding put together someone is i think someone is trolling you but yes to be malding to be a good coach <laughs> yes it helps <laughs> <laughs> So I, it sounded like a troll kind of question, but I wasn't yeah. sure what it meant. But so it could have been a legitimate yeah. question. Um, I think it's just it's a common slang that's being thrown around to just to like mess with the balding streamers. I think. Yeah, but I mean, that's dick, man. That's a dick thing. It's the internet. Yeah. Um. Okay. 
So, so uh, Risker asks, why do you think that players burn out so quickly in esports compared to other stuff? Um, oh, there's like there's, there's a long list. Which which there's there's a long list of reasons that I could answer here, but each and every single one because you know everybody's different. Everybody's going to burn out for a different reason. Sure. I think think that that. Um, I'm going to go with a little bit of a weird one, one that I think is actually really impactful, but that nobody is talking about. And I think it's the lack of role models for the players, in that uh, the players themselves are role models, but a lot of them don't have role models of their own. You know, some players have very supportive parents, and that's good, but probably the majority of parents uh, are not supportive or are not involved uh, in the esports athletes. You know, career choice, especially when you're having Korean players come over to America mm -hmm. uh, or Europe. Uh, you know, not only are they separated from their parents and also but from their culture, you have some people who started playing video games because they had a rocky relationship with their parents. So you're having this situation where these people are the best in the world and they're being looked up to by kind of the next generation. They're expected to kind of be perfect, be a good example, but nobody's taught them how to do those things. And that pressure uh, can really get to people. So I think it, I think it's going to be the lack of role models that the the current um, professional players have that kind of is one dude. That is like a fantastic answer. That's brilliant. What are some of the other things that kind of come to your mind? Uh, some people just want to play games and get paid for them. They don't actually want to be the best. Uh, so when they get to the league, they stop trying. And then another one is that people's motivations to be the best is to be better than other people rather than be better than themselves. And both of those are also pretty catastrophic once you make it to the league. Yeah, so... Um, so, the, the, a couple of things. So one is, uh, just want to pay and play and get paid. I think that's something that I don't... It's in, a really interesting observation. As far as people wanting to be better than others and not better than themselves, that's actually something that I think, once again, there's a lot of psychology, neuroscience, and actual interventions that you can do to fix. So right now, I'm trying to develop... Uh, 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 two years ago, I developed sort of an, uh, 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 an evidence-based or scientifically-based meditation regimen for addiction. So we have... Like, we know from, like, different kinds of fMRI studies and things like that that there's some deficiencies or vulnerabilities in the brain of people who have addictions. And we also know that meditation affects the brain in different ways. So can we sort of look at what we understand about the brain and develop a meditation regimen that specifically targets the weaknesses for people who have addiction? And the answer is yes. And now actually what I'm working on, because I think this is actually way more fascinating, is um, a regimen to target narcissism and ego. And... My experience has been that like when you target narcissism and ego, it, it cultivates, so it gets rid of that sort of my value or my sense of self is based on a relationship to others. The second thing it gets rid of, or the second thing it does is it starts to cultivate empathy. Because if you think about like your an identity that's based on a relationship to others, it's all like very egocentric. And so you don't, the only reason that you think about other people is not to like think about what their experience is like, their value in your life is to use as a measuring stick for yourself. You don't really think about them as human beings. You just think about them as like objects to beat. They become milestones instead of people. And, and I think it's really fascinating because this, this is also very prevalent in investment banking because everyone is sort of like you have bonuses, right? So people get salaries, which is like 50%. And then people get bonuses of like, you know, anywhere between a hundred and like, a million dollars a year. And when you when you're sort of fig figuring out how much you're valued, you compare your bonus to other people. And as long as you're kind of doing that, that can be very hard on your ego. It can be very like fueling for your ego and it can cause a lot of suffering. But I think that's huge in terms of you know, don't try to be better than anyone else because that's sort of like an egotistical kind of thing and like there are ways to dissolve that ego, which I think it, at the same time is going to improve empathy. So fascinating. Any other thoughts? So you mentioned lack of role models. Some people just want to play and they want to get paid. And then people who want to be better than others as opposed to better than themselves. Uh, those are, you know, <laughs> those are probably the main three that uh, yeah. are, yeah, 
you know, there's obviously like not caring about your physical health or thinking that physical health has no bearing on uh, game performance. Like, I don't know why that myth still exists, but yeah, it's very common. It's like, you know, if you sleep and drink water and work out, you're going to play better. And people are like, no, I just need to play. <laughs> yeah. You know, you know why they why? think that, Jane? Why? why? Because they've never cared about their physical health and look how far they got. Yeah, no kidding. Right. Right. So I, I once heard um, a great, uh, there's a great kind of quote about the NBA. Um, so I think the hardest moment in a coach's life is when you go into a championship game at halftime, or maybe this is the NFL. You go into the champion, you go to the Super Bowl at halftime and tell your team that the strategy, so you're down at halftime in the Super Bowl. The hardest speech a coach has ever had to give is going into the, the locker room at halftime of the Super Bowl when you're down and telling your team that the strategy that got you to this point is not working. Right? So like, why don't That's they prioritize phys physical health? Because they haven't had to. Yeah. You know, subsisting off of Doritos, pizza, and Mountain Dew has gotten them this far. So why would they change? Um, so I guess, so a question to Jane. So Cannabis asks, you talked about people being inefficient learners. How would you suggest people learn, uh, people approach learning Overwatch? Um, run towards the fear is the phrase that I really like. Um, in that there's a lot of pros who actually don't know how some of the characters in the game work, and I don't understand how that's acceptable or even becomes a thing. Um, but what running towards the fear means is that if something annoys you or frustrates you or you think it's overpowered or, or underpowered, for example, learning the extremes or the things that kind of stick out to you, like it's uh, you know, Zenyatta players, for example, uh, people who one-trick heroes, like Zenyatta, for example, they become very susceptible to being killed by flankers, for example. And they, a Zenyatta player, is always going to think that Genji and Tracer and Sombra are overpowered pieces of shit. Um, but what you should do is if you are playing that hero and you're, you, know, you hate that thing, you fear that thing, it just it annoys you, it frustrates you, play those heroes and try and assassinate Zens, and you'll learn from the other perspective what it looks like. It becomes, it gains you the ability to empathize with your opponent, and empathy doesn't have to be a good thing, but there's also the way that people approach a game psychologically in terms of winning competitive battles, one-on-one 66s, is, is they always try to force. They always try and force something to happen, and they never try and coax. They never try and coax the opponent into doing something that they want to in the absence of force. And in order to properly co coax an opponent, uh, you need to be able to empathize with them. That's that's awesome, Jim. Um, that is a, another principle which I haven't talked about yet, but I, I work with a lot, which is the difference between creation and cultivation. Mm -hmm. So I think our, our society has, has gotten to the point where we always try to create something and we've forgotten the value of cultivating. And a lot of the change that I advocate for is not is not for people to create change in their life, but to cultivate change. And I think what you just said about forcing versus coaxing is to understand that like some of the best ways to do things in life are not to actually like zero in and, and shoot for it gung ho, which is sort of what our society kind of propagates, but to like let things grow. Anyway, I think um we're at time for today so thanks for coming on jane and you know any any closing thoughts that you have no i just i, I hope everyone enjoyed it and uh it's... yeah man i think it was awesome i think people are loving it everyone yeah, is saying you... is that you're next level wise and a smart guy <laughs> i appreciate that but if i was to you know one of the things is just also if... also you got us a hundred gift subs from low dpm so that was I mean, I've never seen that before. I, mean, I literally thought someone was cut. getting hacked. That's funny. But uh, no, like one of the one of the most important things that I would encourage anyone to do is think about how you're thinking and learn how to learn. That's the number one piece of advice I'd give anyone who wants to improve at something or become a master of any task. Completely agree, man. So thank you so much for coming on. You know, good luck with um, everything you're doing with Team Canada and Dallas Fuel. 
And then, uh, you know, if there's any way that that uh, we can support you in terms of any of this stuff, um, I, I know we talked a little bit about like esports stuff, but if you guys want to like learn meditation, that just let me know. And then the last thing is, you know, when when you are ready to reveal things in terms of your secret projects. If there's any any way that we can support you or help spread the word or things like that, um, you know, I started streaming on Twitch about a month ago, but things are growing slowly and steadily. And so, if there's any way that we can, you know, help you, because I, I, I mean, I agree a hundred percent with your missions. I think that that's, I mean, what I loved about going to India and studying to become a monk is that like yoga is the system that teaches you how your mind works. Mm-hmm. Like it teaches you like where do desires come from, why do thoughts happen where how do behaviors function like how does all this stuff inside you work it's like a formal class on the self um and so if anything to support that mission of helping people like learn how they think and to think how about their thinking and to learn about how they learn is something that i'm 100 percent in favor of so thanks a lot man thanks for having me on enjoy the rest of your stream take care good luck bye now